Well, we're looking at Daniel 4 tonight, and uh, with Daniel 4, there's just a, a million different places to go. Uh, just, if you like connecting chapters to other chapters and other books, then Daniel 4 is a great one. The whole book of Daniel is great like this. So, uh, a couple different ways we could go. Uh, we could just look at how does Daniel 4 connect within the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is, is interesting. Uh, if you look at all 12 chapters, and of course it's not broken up by chapters when it was first written, but it is now and it helps us organize. Um, but the first 12, if you look at the 12 chapters, there's a pretty obvious break halfway, midway, after the first six and then chapters 7 through 12. The first six are like historical narrative and then the last six are uh, more ap apocalyptic they, they, they sound a little more like revelation so we could ask how does chapter four fit within the first six chapters because it is in that section there and there, there are connections there's another really interesting division in daniel like no other book in the entire bible which is chapters two through seven, about half the book, are in a different language. That chapter one and chapters eight through 12 were originally written in Hebrew, but chapters two through seven, we have in Aramaic. So chapters, chapter four is in the middle of that. So how is chapter four connected within that Aramaic section that the author has intentionally written in a different language? Uh, we could look at that, and we actually will look at that more next week when we look at chapter 5. Um, however, I think what we'll do this week is look at at least a little bit about how chapter 4 is connected to chapter 2. Because chapters 2, 3, and 4 are pretty distinct as well, and they are distinct, special in this way. King Nebuchadnezzar is a major player. Right. In chapter 1, he's referenced, but he's really not in the story. Uh, Daniel is dealing with King Nebuchadnezzar's official and rejecting the food offered by King Nebuchadnezzar. Right? He's not really in there. But in Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar's threatening Daniel's life until he has that interpretation of his dream, the statue, right, with the head of gold and and the, the, the silver and the bronze and the iron and the clay and all that, remember? And, uh, so that's chapter 2. Um, and then chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar is threatening Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's life for not bowing down to his big statue of gold. And, and in chapter 4, uh, we have King Nebuchadnezzar again, a major player. So this is the last of three chapters where King Nebuchadnezzar is a major player. And uh, unlike the first two, he's not threatening any of the lives of our heroes, uh, specifically Daniel. But chapter four um, is very connected, very similar in some ways to chapter two, right? I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he can't, understand it entirely he probably does get it in part uh, enough to be nervous right there's this if you haven't read Daniel chapter 4 pause this video right now and read it because we're not going to read it now I'm assuming you have read it when I talk about it here so in Daniel chapter 4 King Nebuchadnezzar has had another dream like chapter 2 and what we see in this dream is he envisions uh, that there's this great tree and the beasts of the field, the birds, they've all come and they find shade and rest under this tree. He probably has an understanding that this tree might be him um, and that the tree is chopped down. So again, his future uh, doesn't look so bright. Um, it's hard to imagine he didn't have some idea what was going on with this dream. It's almost like when we read it, we can understand right a little bit or at least it seems like we would have um, maybe it just seems that way because we already know what, how Daniel interprets it but Daniel does interpret it as uh, oh king this is I'm sad to say this is bad news for you um, 
and and here's why you know that you are great but uh, you're gonna have a big fall and then King Nebuchadnezzar does he loses his mind he loses his kingdom and what we find at the end of chapter 4 is it's restored when he humbles himself so we do see this connection between 2 and 4 um, but what is what is the the main point or of chapter 4 and, and and how does it even add to what we already learned in chapter 2 um, well I think we can get the main point of chapter 4 just by looking at uh, the verses that are repeated at the very beginning of chapter 4 and at the very end in Daniel chapter 4 verses verse 3 and Daniel chapter 4 verse 34 are very similar and I think when we look at these two verses one at the beginning and one at the end we can get the point of all of Daniel 4 and then maybe we can talk about how it adds a little something to what we've already learned so far in Daniel and Daniel chapter 3 or chapter 4 verse 3 um, King Nebuchadnezzar is, is the one sharing this chapter. This is King Nebuchadnezzar's decree that he's making to his whole kingdom. He's king and he's making a decree. And he says, How great are his signs, that is the Lord, the Most High, the King of Heaven. How mighty his wonder. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. That's verse 3. And in verse 34, after he's gone through this very difficult lesson, as we get all the way to the end, he's in power, he, in his pride, he begins to admire his kingdom and brag about it. And just like the dream warned him and Daniel warned him in the interpretation, the Lord just humbles him. He loses his mind. He loses his kingdom. He's out in the field with the beast. Uh, eating grass. He's, he's a mess. He's lost it all. But when he looks to heaven and humbles himself, his mind is restored and his kingdom is restored to him. And after all of this, he says in verse 34, um, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Now that may sound verbatim, like verse 3, like exactly, but it's, it's not quite. A scripture loves to do this. Repeat it, but repeat it in a slightly different way. It's almost like they don't want to always repeat just exactly, so they change it up just enough but not so much that we can't see the obvious connection. So verse 3 said, His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion endures from generation to generation. Verse 34 just flipped kingdom and dominion, and now starts with dominion. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. That's awesome to think about, right? Like Babylon is long gone uh, as far as a, a world power, a kingdom, like anything, like King Nebuchadnezzar had. King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is gone. He's gone. But uh, the king of heaven, his kingdom endures from generation to generation. I was walking through Colonial Williamsburg just yesterday and saw some of those old trees and was just so impressed thinking, Boy, these trees have outlasted generations. And uh, then thought of this chapter, this verse, and uh, these two verses, which, by the way, have a connection to chapter 2, right? In chapter 2, verse 44, um, you get almost the same thing when Daniel is interpreting the King Nebuchadnezzar's dream from chapter 2, where he says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven 
will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it, it will itself endure forever. So clear connection between Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 2, besides the fact that King Nebuchadnezzar has a disturbing dream that Daniel interprets for him, is also this emphasis on God is sovereign. God is sovereign. So why have Daniel chapter 4 if Daniel chapter 2 has already delivered the same message? Is it just repeating or is Daniel chapter 4 adding a new layer for us? Um, and I want to say it's adding uh, another nuance, uh, another piece to how we view Daniel's God, our Savior, the God of heaven, the King of heaven, the God of gods and the Lord of kings, as Nebuchadnezzar said back in chapter 2, verse 47. What do we see so different in chapter 4? Or maybe just what do we see that's emphasized more in chapter 4? And I want to say it's this, that God is merciful in his sovereignty. Take in for a minute how merciful God is to King Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar has seen some great things now in chapter 2 and in chapter 3. right? He had a miraculous interpretation to his dream by Daniel. Remember, Daniel didn't just interpret the dream. Daniel told him the dream that he had before he told Daniel. So he was blown away. He knew that Daniel's God was different than all the other gods he had been dealing with. That Daniel's God was the God of God. God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer, the revealer of mysteries. Um, that word, by the way, remember we said in chapter 2, mystery comes up eight times. And out of nine in the whole Old Testament, eight of them is in chapter 2. The other time is in chapter 4, where when King Nebuchadnezzar is talking to him, he says, oh yeah, I know you. Uh, you. You reveal mysteries. Your God reveals mysteries. I believe it's in verse 9. Uh, I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. The uh, only other place besides chapter 2 where that um, word is used in the Old Testament. So another clear connection, but, but what's new about chapter 4 is God's mercy. That what has happened here in chapter, chapter 4 is King Nebuchadnezzar, by all we can tell, is saved. That the king of Babylon is saved. And the only reason he is saved is because the king of heaven... Our God has been so patient and merciful with King Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, he should have caught it after chapter 2. And if not, after Daniel reveals that dream, how about after chapter 3? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not only pop out of the blazing furnace and don't even smell like smoke, but he saw one like the Son of God in there with them. That he saw a fourth. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told him who it was. And King Nebuchadnezzar is blown away and says, No God can save like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, he, and he's right. And he forgets again. And in his pride, he talks about how great his kingdom is. Even though he's already had a dream where Daniel said, This kingdom's going to end. He just, in his pride, he, he doesn't listen. He doesn't adhere to Daniel's advice to repent, to be humble before God. And yet even then in chapter 4, when in his pride he speaks out, and God still waits for him. While he's lost his mind out there in the fields, he restores him. And in God's patience and in God's mercy, the king of Babylon is saved. God is merciful 
and his sovereignty. And so there's a clear application for us. And it's a lot like the application we had for ourselves in Daniel 2. Be like Daniel. You know, when Daniel interprets King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he's disturbed, he's distressed. He's not happy about it. I mean, he could have been, like sometimes Christians can come off as, like King Nebuchadnezzar, you're finally going to get what you deserve. But he doesn't say that. He's distressed and he says, King, you know, humble yourself, turn to God. Maybe he'll relent. You know, maybe he'll extend your prosperity. You've been so prosperous. Maybe he'll be merciful and, and let it continue. Daniel feels for him. But King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't and he gets the consequences. God, though, waits and he turns. And there's this piece, too, for us. Um, be merciful like Daniel. I mean, the ba Babylon was the epitome of evil, and this is the king of Babylon. And God is merciful in waiting for him. It's going to be a different story. He's actually merciful to the next king. It doesn't end the same way. We'll see in chapter 5. But what we can take out of chapter 4, too, is that if we'll be like Daniel, and we'll be merciful to people, and not hope for them to receive judgment, but rather with the time God's given them, to be like Daniel and to do whatever we can to persuade them to, to repent, to change, to turn to God that he might extend mercy to them. That if we'll be like that, there's always hope. If the king of Babylon can repent, anybody can. This is possibly the most shocking changed life in all of scripture. Uh, Paul comes to mind too, right? Uh, Saul, who's a, a murderer of Christians, becoming a Christian. And there's, there's many other beautiful stories I'm sure we could think of, uh, of repentance, not only in Scripture, but outside of Scripture. But I mean, this is an amazing one. The king of Babylon has become a believer. He is saying at the beginning of the chapter 4 and at the end that God's sovereignty never ends, that his dominion, his kingdom is everlasting, that it endures from generation to generation. I mean, that's, that's covenant language between God and his people. That's like Psalm 103, I believe is verses 17 and 18, <coughs> that it appears from chapter 4 that the king of Babylon gets it and is saved. Oh, God's sovereign. He's sovereign in chapter 4, uh, just like he was in chapter 2. But chapter 4 is a display of God's mercy and his sovereignty. And the application for us is to be merciful, like Daniel. Take advantage of the time that God is extending to sinners to repent. And be merciful for them, towards them. And, and help them get underneath these sinners, lay down your lives, lay down our lives in order to see even just one repent. And we never lose hope, because even the king of Babylon became a believer. Amazing. Have a good night.